Good evening. It is time for our midweek Bible study. Like I say, I'm running a little bit behind this week, or could you say the holidays pushed me back a day? Um, so, broadcasting on Wednesday instead of Tuesday. Apologize for those that was looking for me yesterday. Um, just some things come up. But we're back on it tonight, and we're going to finish up chapter 8 of um, Judges. And we're continuing that study and get our story. Get everything done with Gideon this evening, I think, if, we, if our time works out well. Um, before we get into our Bible study, let's just um, review a few announcements. Um, like I say, we're still doing our Sunday morning service um, at 9 o'clock in the church parking lot. So like I say, just pull up, find a parking place, um, tune your radio to 87.9. It was kind of nice weather. Um, last Sunday, some people just sat there and just used the speakers and um, listened through the windows. Um, so like I say, depends on the weather. If there is a weather issue, we'll let you know through Facebook or through the prayer chain somehow. Um, we'll get the word out. But like I said, we're going to continue this. Um, I did get word from another person that went to another church that their pastor announced that there was four, count, four churches in the Lumberton area that have been closed down because of COVID. Um, they're all churches that went back in. So don't know all the details of that, but that was what their pastor had told them at their service, be in prayer for, the, for them. Um, so like I say, a lot going on with this virus. Um, there's talk of, of you know, Vaccines coming out, possibly November, sometime to January. Don't know. Um, the Lord does. But what we got to do is be in prayer um, for each other and be in prayer for those who have been affected by it and those who have lost loved ones. Um, we need to be good stewards of our prayer with that. Um, so like I, say, if, like I say, if you do come to the services, if you get out of your vehicles, please put a mask on. Um, where, you know, you say, well, I'm not sick. Well, it's not necessarily to protect you or protect somebody else. So let's just be good um, Christians and follow good habits there. Um, also, Samaritan's Purse, we're running behind, so we need to get those items in for the shoe boxes. Remember, no candy, no food of any kind, no liquids, no toothpaste, um, nothing that has any kind of military insignia or any kind of look of military. Um, remember, so these go to the country, some uh, countries that are not too safe, and those type of things can get children hurt. You know, we don't think about it, but people are different in other parts of the of the world, and their cultures look at things differently. So please adhere to these things. Um, but let, yes, let's just do what we can, get those supplies in for the Christmas shoe boxes. Also, remember the Methodist Church will continue to support their food pantry. So if you have those items, bring those in. Also, excuse me. Um, so we'll have that, but like I say, we're just going to continue to go, um, with our outside services. I'll do the services, um, for the Bible study during the week. Um, prayer request, um, there's a list on the bulletin. Like I say, we hand out Sunday morning. Um, do be in prayer. Karen went to the doctor today and she does have to go back and have some more tests done next week. Um, not what we were expecting, but God's got it. Um, we've also had some deaths in the church family and extended family, so be in prayer for those. Also, others who are battling. Um, some are healing up from surgeries. But some are having some tests coming up. Um, some are waiting results. So there's a lot of different things going on um, with the different things. Um, we still like to say we have to remember those. You know, we got some that are fighting cancer. We got some that are you know fighting some lung issues. Um, so like I said, we just have a mixture and that's why we have really to get careful with each other and watch out for each other. Um, it's common sense for the most part, but like I say, um, a lot of people sometimes just, it's just a catch. It just slips by. So we just need to be careful. Um, so like I say, um, be in prayer for our country. Um, definitely a lot going on in the nation. Um, still got a lot of unrest, a lot of protests, a lot of those things going on for all kinds of reasons. A lot of times we hear just one or two, there's a lot of other reasons going on for other protests in other parts of the country. Um, like I say, we got the elections coming up very quickly. We have children in school, we have children that are out of school, we got virtual school, and those are in part-time school, and all these different situations. I saw, I think today, ECU has a thousand um, cases of COVID just among the students at um, East Carolina. So, you know, the virus is going through the students, just a lot going on. Um, then you get the whole um, issue with the economy, the unemployment, restrictions and all, a lot of stress with people. We just need to be aware of all these things. And we as Christians need to do the best we can 
one, to be an example to others of how we can allow God to work through us and how we can rely on God to get us through these things, you know, so we can be a witness by just our actions and our words. But also look for the opportunity to minister. Um, sometimes it's just an encouraging word. Sometimes just taking time to pray with somebody. Sometimes you just got to let people vent. You know, you got two ears and one mouth. Sometimes you just got to open up your ears and just let people just get it off their chest, you know, and release you know, whatever the need is. But be alert to those things. You know, be considerate and be compassionate. A little kindness goes a long way. And the scripture tells us, never grow weary of doing good. And I think sometimes we as Christians, we, we, you know, we're dreading doing good sometimes. Scared to do it. Um, we'll talk a little bit, some about that tonight, a little bit in the study. Um, so like I say, and actually that'll be a little bit more on Sunday morning, I think, too, also, as we're working on that. So like I say, all of this, um, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this day. And Father, we thank you for your many blessings. And Father, we do, did enjoy the wonderful, cool weather of the weekend. It was cooler. It felt refreshing. I know that the rains have come. Um, the weather has changed. It's that time of year. We're going to flip back and forth for a while before we get on into the true fall and into winter. And Father, we just pray that you would continue to watch over us. And Father, be with those families already that have experienced storms in their areas and had damage. And Father, just bless them. And Father, we just pray for our nation. Father, there's just so much going on. We got the virus going on, we got elections going on, we got this going on, and protests, and schools, some in, some out, same with colleges, and all these different upheavals, the unemployment, and people struggling to get by, and Father, we just pray for those individuals in our nation. And Father, we know our nation will not be healed until the spirit of the people is healed. So many people just decide to pursue what they want. And do what is right in their own eyes. That's just why Judges is such an appropriate study as we go through that at this time. And Father, just help us to help others. Use us as your tools. Use us as your trumpet. And Father, may we always be encouraging and positive and uplifting. And Father, we pray for the churches. We're hearing that there are churches that had to shut down. Not because they voluntarily shut down, but because of COVID. It got into the congregation and it's spreading and Father, we just pray that you just bless those congregations and heal those members. And Father, let everyone make the wise decisions. God, them, direct them according to your will. And Father, we just ask that you um, be with us as, in our church as we continue to do what you guide us to do. And Father, may we be sensitive. Father, you've blessed us from the very start with wonderful weather on Sunday mornings, and we thank you. Father, it's just been wonderful. Some days have been hot, and some days have been cooler, but... Father, you've allowed us to have service every Sunday, and we just thank you for that, and we just pray that you'll continue to do that for us. And Father, we just lift up those on our prayer list, Lord, that's in our bulletin, and those we mentioned. And Father, we have so many people going on so many different things. And Father, we do have shut-ins in our church, and those who are not able to get out. And Father, we just pray that you'll strengthen and bless them. And Father, we also pray for those who are undergoing tests and have going to the doctor visits, different things going on in their lives. And Father, we just pray that you'll watch over them and Father, let them know they're not alone. We know going to the doctor is a whole different experience today than it was a year ago. And Father, we just pray that you'll just watch over and keep them. And Father, we also pray for those who are in healing. We've had several that have had surgeries in recent weeks and months. And Father, they're still continuing to heal and get their strength back. And bless them, Lord, as they continue to get, get back on this track. And Father, for others who have upcoming procedures, bless them and keep them, Lord. And Father, we just thank you for the wonderful blessings and healings that are taking place. And Father, we also just ask for guidance in the lives. There's many people who are making decisions and among the congregation and outside the congregation, friends and families and decisions that have to be made. And Father, we just pray that you'll bless them. Give them the wisdom that they need and the insight and understanding. And Father, we just pray for our nation, the leadership, Lord, let them work together. Father, it's so hard to listen to the fighting this day after day. You don't hear where they're working together. You hear constant bickering and fighting. And that be it at the you know national level, the state level, even down into the county, we hear squabblings. And Father, we just need peace and people that work together as a team. That work together for your good. Father, we just pray for that. 
pray for our nation. And Father, be with our military who are serving overseas and at home and keep them safe. And Father, pray for our first responders and firefighters, policemen, ambulance drivers, nurses, doctors, even to, you know, down to the line workers, people who are going to work every day and being around other people. They, you know, it's, it's tough. It can be stressful. And Father, clear down, you know, we don't think much about it, but you know, you know, the stock, those who put up the stock and the cashiers and all those, you know, they come in contact with so many people and they don't know who has the virus and who doesn't. They're, right? They're taking the precautions and Father, just pray to keep them safe. But sometimes we just overlook those individuals and Father, just guide us as a nation, guide us as a people. And Father, will guide this church and may we do what is according to your will. Bless us in all that we do. May we grow and increase in numbers. I know it's a hard time to grow right now, Lord, but that's man's view. You can do all things at all times. And Father, we just pray that you just bless our efforts and guide us through these times that we'll do all things according to your will. And Father, we're reaching out and touching people that we normally don't because we're using the internet and broadcasting. And Father, we just pray that they'll hear the message and that their lives can be touched and changed and that they'll grow closer to you, Lord. Guide us and direct us in all things. Teach us, and Father, bless this time as we go through the scriptures, Lord. Teach us through your study that we'll understand more and grow closer to you. For it's in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. All right, we're into Judges, so turn your Bibles to chapter 8. We're Like I said, we're going to pick up verse 18. Um, a lot of different things. Remember last time we were coming through and Gideon had stopped back at the cities of you know, Sakoth and Penyon, you know. And one of the things we found out going through this is that not everybody who joined in was with Gideon. Um, a lot, and that's what we saw with the men of Sakoth and Penyon, you know, the two and a half tribes on the other side of Jordan. They weren't, you know, hey Gideon, you go do that. But you know, hey, we're not gonna help you. We're not gonna, you know, they refused to give the men food. Um, that were pursuing the enemy. They'd already routed 120,000. And, you know, they just still didn't think Gideon was going to win. And they said, we're not helping you. And because of that, Gideon came back and he punished them. Just as he told them, what he, you know, he beat them with the briars and tore down the, t you know, the tower at Peniel and even had some of them killed um, because they, tra they were traitors to God and their own people. And um, so like I say, he, he, you know, Gideon and his three men were pursuing the Midianites that had, you know, been blasting and just, you know, persecuting the Israelites, you know, coming in and taking everything they had for seven years. And some of these people didn't jump in to help. You know, it's like, hey, you go do it. If it works out, great. If not, you know, hey, we weren't involved. You know, it's sad it's true. And it's that way in a lot of churches and a lot of Christians. I, I say churches, but when I say churches, you really have to look at it and say, what is a church? A church is a body of believers. And so when you talk about churches, you're talking about the believer. You know, as a general term, and so here are believers. You know, they're just ready to take a stand off view. They just rather buy a ticket. Sit in the stand and watch everything go by. Hey, if it works out great, if not, hey, I wasn't involved. That's the wrong attitude. And that's why so many churches are plagued with the problems they are and why church attendance is shutting down. And so then after this, you know, we got into our discussion on hospitality. Um, you know, what we do and how we treat others. Um, but we always do it as unto the Lord. See, if we are hospitable and do it unto the Lord, it makes a difference. But there's a lot of churches and Christians that have lost their hospitality. I've walked in some churches, like I say, I've done a lot of pulpit supply over the years, and I've walked in some churches, and you know, you get the friendly handshake from one or two individuals, and then you just get the stares. Who's he? What's he doing here? What's he gonna say? Isn't he gonna shut up? It's 12 o'clock, he's running over. Yeah, it's just, you get this look, and I, you know, I'm not exaggerating, sometimes I really do wonder if I was really welcome in some places. And, you know, they asked me to come and speak because their pastor was out, and. I really wondered some of them, but there's others that were just graciously hospitable, just wonderful. Um, so like I say, it goes from church to church, but churches need to be hospitable and we need to have that. But you need to be hospitable. As a Christian, we need to practice hospitality. So that's where we're picking up on the second part of our study at chapter eight. So let's begin at verse 18 and read. 
Then said he unto Zeba and Zalmunna, What manner of men were they whom ye slew at Tabor? And he answered, As thou art, so were they. Each one resembled the child of a king. And he said, They were my brethren, even the sons of my mother. As the Lord liveth, if ye had saved them alive, I would not slay you. And he said unto Jether, his firstborn, up and slay them. But the youth drew not his sword, for he feared because he was yet a youth. Then Zeba and Zalmunna said, Rise thou and fall upon us. As for the man is, so is his strength. And Gideon arose and slew Zeba and Zalmunna and took away the ornaments that were on their camel's neck. Now, what, where are we at with this? Remember, you know, Sukkoth and Yol say, hey, you know, you haven't kept, captured Zeba and Zalmunna, we're, we're not helping you. Well, Gideon came back and said, hey, I've got them. And then he takes them on over and he says, okay, now it's time to do a family business. Yeah, this is the part we don't see coming until we get to this. But somewhere, and it's believed in one of the previous raids of the Midianites into Israel, that something happened at Tabor, which is where Gideon's brothers were. And these two kings were responsible for Gideon's brothers dying. Now, Jewish law held that it was the family's responsibility to carry out justice. They didn't have state police and county police. They didn't have all that at that time. And so it was up to the family to execute judgment. But there was rules, there's guidelines, excuse me, and there was a right or wrong way to do it. But it was within Gideon's right that his brothers were killed to take out vengeance upon these two kings as they were responsible for it. Now, you know, like I say, Gideon at this point, he, he's getting ready to take care of family business. You think about it, he's arrived, he's got these, this is like a, a procession, a celebration, everybody's like, wow, look what Gideon's done, look what it threw him, you know. Everybody's all excited, and right here, Gideon says, no, I'm gonna handle this as it should be handled. I'm gonna take care of my family business, excuse me. And there was a slight interruption there. And so with that, Gideon decides he's gonna take care of it. Now, how a man died, particularly a king, a soldier or such, had a great effect on him. There's a lot of, what you call how the family was looked upon. He, you know, hey, he was slew by, you know, this, you know, they had this whole thing of how they died, you know, and so what that happens was with this, having dealt with them, now he was going to embarrass them. He was going to bring shame upon them. Not only had they killed his brothers, he was going to bring shame upon them. And what he was going to do, and you have to understand sort of the history about this, if they died at the hands of a mighty soldier, that was one thing. But if they died at the hand of a child or a youth, an un, you know, unseasoned soldier or somebody that was, you know, that was embarrassing because you get back and you look, you got, there was a reputation that was associated with how they died. You know, that he died in honor, that's one thing. He died at the hand of, you know, a kid. Uh, that doesn't sound so great when you write, you know, the article, you know, articles of the king. So you look about this, you know, Abimelech, you know, he didn't want to die at the hand of a woman. King Saul didn't want to die at the hand of the Philistines. He saw shame in them. And here now, Gideon, what's he doing? He's saying, Jether, kill him. He tells his young son, kill these two, execute the family judgment. But Jether is too young to understand. And I shouldn't say understand, but he doesn't have the nerve you know, it's one thing to say, oh, I'm going to get revenge on somebody. But when you have to look into the eye of somebody and execute judgment, that's a whole different thing. I was um, took a tour of the West Virginia State Penitentiary. I'm from the Mounds area, and there's a West Virginia um, State Penitentiary that they closed down, and now it's a museum and all. But sitting it out in the lobby section of it, there is the electric chair. In the electric chair, you know, interesting stories behind it, but the bottom line was there was three switches. 
and each switch was wired, but nobody knew which one was really wired to the power. And so they'd have three people that would go up and have to pull the switch. But the whole key of the whole thing was no one knew who, where they were the one that actually threw the switch that killed the person in the chair. That was supposed to help alleviate some of the guilt upon a person that was chosen to throw the switch. Well, maybe I didn't do it. The other thing was a family couldn't come back and say, hey, he was the executioner or my brother or my uncle or my father or whatever. And so with that, it also took the blame away uh, that they, somebody couldn't say back. He was just doing his job. It's hard. Even as a parent, sometimes it's hard to punish a child. You love them so much, but you know that they've done something wrong. They need to be punished and corrected. And looking it through their eyes, sometimes that is so hard. You know, you hear these statements and as a child, you, you never made sense of you. I do this because I love you, you know, and the child sitting there saying, well, you love me, you wouldn't beat me or you wouldn't ground me or you wouldn't punish me or whatever. And, you know, it's never easy. Not if you have a compassionate heart and not if you have a concern for others. Vindictive, out of hate, meanness, anger, oh yeah. A lot of things have been done with those attitudes. But here, Jethro is not mature enough. And so what happens, Zalmunna and Zeba, they, you know, kind of guild, you know, poke at, you know, Gideon and say, hey, what kind of man are you? You know, as a man, you know, they start saying, you know, and they really kind of make him angry because really they've decided if we're going to die, let us die at the hand of Gideon. They knew they were going to die. And the other thing, there's the other thing about it is Gideon knew how to swing a sword. They see Gideon as this conquering soldier. This, and you know, it's going to go back to Midian, you know, and all the of them, and they're going to say, "Hey, this kid, Gideon and his three hundred—they routed one hundred and thirty-five thousand men. Gideon is a mighty man. So for the kings to die at the hand of Gideon would not look bad. It wouldn't be shameful." And so they kind of, you know, hey, Gideon, hey, Gideon. And we poked at him and made him angry, and he draws a sword, and he kills them. And their consolation was if Gideon knows how to swing a sword, it's going to be a quick death. It's not going to be a pain one. It's not going to get messed up. And Gideon does it out of anger. He executes it. Hits his right. But he does it, and he's angry about it. So let's move on, because now it gets kind of, I don't want to say wishy-washy, but it gets kind of confusing because you're thinking, man, things are rolling along so good for Gideon. What, you know, and now all of a sudden we're going to get this other image. And a lot of people kind of have disputes, I shouldn't say, or different views on these things. So now look at verses 22 through 32. Then the men of Israel said unto Gideon, Rule thou over us, both thou and thy son, and thy son, son also. For thou hast delivered us from the hand of Midian. And Gideon said unto them, I will not rule over you. Neither shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. There's the good part. And then verse 24 says, And Gideon said unto them, I would desire a request of you that you would give me every man the earrings of his prey. For they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. And they answered, we will willingly give them. And they spread a garment and did cast therein every man the earrings of his prey. And the weight of the golden earrings that he requested was a thousand seven hundred shekels of gold. Besides the ornaments and the collars and the purple raiment that was on the kings of Midian, and beside the chains that were about the camel's necks, Gideon made an ephod thereof and put it in his city, even in Ophrah. And all Israel went there thither, a whoring after it. 
which thing became a snare unto Gideon into his house. Thus, <clears throat> thus was Midian subdued before the children of Israel, so that they lifted up their heads no more. And the country was in quietness forty years in the days of Gideon. And Jerubbaal, the son of Joash, went down and dwelt in his own house. And Gideon had three score and ten sons of his body begotten, for he had many wives. And his concubine that was in Shechem, she also bare him a son, whose name he called Abimelech. And Gideon, the son of Joash, died at a good old age and was buried in the sepulcher of Joash, his father, and Ophrah of the Abiezites. And let's go on down through 35. And it came to pass, as soon as Gideon was dead, that the children of Israel turned again and went whoring after Baal. And made Baal bereft their God. And the children of Israel remembered not the Lord their God, who had delivered them out of their hands and all their enemies on every side. Neither showed they kindness to the house of Jeroboam, namely Gideon, according to all the goodness which he had showed unto Israel. Now, going through this, there's a lot going on here, and, and it's a little hard to break down, but it kind of overlaps. But, you know, everybody's asking Gideon, hey, Gideon, come be our king. And what happens is there's two requests made in this thing as we go through this narrative. The people want Gideon to be the king. They want him to set up this, you know, this reign of him and his sons and their sons and, you know, this dynasty, so to speak. And Gideon, you think, okay, he's all right right here. Because what Gideon sees is, oh, they're putting their faith in me and not in God. So we think, okay, Gideon's being mature here. And what he says, and he's quick mind him, he will not rule over him, God will rule over him. That's a good answer. And we think, okay, Gideon's doing good. But it seems like that's about where it stops. It gets kind of funky, kind of weird, funky, messed up, and all, because then we start seeing things kind of turn and start turmoil. I call it turmoil, maybe. Things are going good. So how many of you are quick to do when, you know, when things are going good, and things happen, how many are you good to go to God and say, you know, God, I thank you. Things are just going so good. See, we're always quick to go to God when things are going bad and having problems. But here's everything's going good. You know, the Midianites aren't going to bother me anymore. Gideon's brought back, you know, the kings. They've killed the kings. And now they get all this plunder because, you know, there was all this gold with the Israelites, you know, not just the earrings, but there's all this wealth and everything. They have all these spoils. A lot of people get very rich from this whole thing. And now, you know, things are on the upswing for Israel. But one of the things that happens, and like I say, Gideon makes a statement, oh, God will rule over you. But then there's this other thing that goes on, and I want to kind of just touch on it because I think it goes hand in hand here. When something good happens, are you quick to give God the credit? Or are you one who a friend comes up or a coworker and says, hey man, you're lucky you get that raise. Or you're lucky you get that promotion. Oh, that was fate. Do you stop them and say, no, I was blessed by God? Or do you say, oh yeah, yeah, that's right, and just leave it go? One of the things I learned many years ago, and I still watch it catch myself always in the trap because we hear it all around us, is I do not believe in luck and fate. I don't believe in those things. To me, you know, it's just, they're just words. There's nothing to back it up. Um, and I've tried my, my best to try to look at things truthfully and honestly, but what people call luck, I say, no, that's blessings from God. 
And faith, that was God's will that that happened. I mean, I try to look at things from a step back, not as a uh, pessimist or whatever, it's just no. I, I realize that there are things that God has blessed me with. And sometimes it's the weirdest things. And people say, how do you look at that as a blessing? Oh, I've told stories about different things. You know, I've, I've, I've thanked God for flat tires and busted alternators and all those things. And recently I was reminded of this. And my son, who recently bought a house, um, like I say, he, he, since he grew up and you know, left town, he's had some rough times going on. But he recently bought a house and things have just been kind of rough, especially going through all this COVID and all the different things going on in the real estate market and trying to go through just a lot going on. And so they're working on buying this house. And, and with this thing, they, they closed, they were getting ready to close on the house. Well, part of the thing is he had to fill out a certain form to lock in the interest rate and all this thing. And so he gets a call from his realtor you know, or the bank and says, hey, we have not heard back from you. He goes, heard back from me about what? Well, we sent you a form and you have to you know, sign it and say, yes, this is what the terms we agree to and this will be so we can lock the interest rate in. He says, I've not seen anything. And he checked his personal email, it wasn't there. You know, one in a text on his phone. So he's like, okay, I didn't get it. And so he goes to work and he looks on his work computer and in his work computer, there's this notice from, you know, the bank and people. And he's like, why is it here? And he calls the bank and says, why did you send it to my work? And, they, and they're like, no. He says, well, it's in my work um, email. That's why I didn't see it. I don't, because it got treated as spam. If things come in with a lot of, um, company stuff and all, if it's not a recognized user, they automatically put it over in the spam session. That's exactly what happened. And they checked their file and they said, no, this is the email address you have. He says, yeah, that's my personal email address. But it ended up, and Mark, somehow it ended up over his work thing. So now a couple of days have passed. And they said, well, you know, that, that done, what we sent you is no good now. Now we'll have to rerun it and establish what the interest rate is again. So they rerun the form. And a kind of interesting thing about this thing, you know, there's been several delays, you know, it's like when they close, you know, they locked the deal in on the house, now they were, had to wait for the inspection. Then they had to wait for the, the well, the water check. And then the water check didn't come back in, they had to come back and do another one. So there's been delay after delay after delay, and now here's another two day delay. And so Josh, you know, he gets this form from them and it's kind of interesting, they send it to him. And what's interesting about it is it's lower than the one they said the first time. Where something was going to cost, it was going to, he was going to have to, you know, pay about $1,500, I think. Now it's, he's only going to pay like $300 to lock in. That extra day, something happened in the market and the banking and all that, that the rates changed that much that for him to close out was like, oh, cost him $300. And so he said, man, did you just see how lucky it was? I'm like, no, Josh, you were not lucky. You had, were blessed look upon it what it is. That delay, you were blessed by that delay. That was God's hand. He has been working. We've told him all along. They've been looking for a long time for a house. And we've told him all along. There is a house for you. Keep praying for it. You know, keep trusting God. He's going to get you to the right house. And I said, here's an extreme example of what God's going to do to help you get in that house. Because the money they saved, you know, they saved, they didn't have to pay. They could go out and buy a new washer and dryer for their house or, you know, some other appliance. They're blessed. But a lot of people, and I even had to correct him, was like, no, it's not luck. Gideon, you know, was not lucky. That was God's hand. And a lot of people say, oh, yeah, there's a lot of different talk going on about Gideon. So like I say, Gideon makes this request. We've gone from Gideon says, hey, you know, God will rule over you. And then Gideon says, now, if all you truly, you know, do me a quest, just give me the earrings off of every soldier that you killed that you took the earrings from. That's what they're saying. Everyone that you slayed, they took it, and they were Ishmaelites, so they all wore the custom of the Ishmaelites was wear a gold earring. They said, sure, we'll give you the earring. They said, we'll take everything else off them. We'll, since you let us and you, you know, you, you're, yeah, we'll give it to you. So you know, load this. They take off enough earrings off these soldiers and throw them down on here that the weight is somewhere. Now you think about it, earring don't weigh much. They're not like these big, you know, heavy, bulky things. They're just little weak gold earring. And the weight comes out somewhere between 43 and 70 pounds of gold. 
That's a lot of gold. And if I was looking it up and I did a, a, a search on it, and they said that would be equivalent to between $1 million to $1.6 million. They entered the Indian's request, and they gave him the equivalent of between a million and $1.6 million just by throwing the earrings down. Now, Gideon also got the plunder off the kings that he killed and those from his mouth. So he had other riches that he got from this, but just as he got between, they just threw it down his feet. And so Gideon does something that becomes a problem. He takes this gold and he has this elaborate ephod, which is an outer garment made. It's really like a priestly garment. We hear about when we're talking about the priest and he has it made and he takes it and what happens is it becomes sort of like an idol because we hear terms about it um, as we go through this. It's very strange. We don't know, and it's not real clear because we're not giving a lot of detail, did Gideon all of a sudden start looking at himself as a priest? because he makes this elaborate gold ephod that's an outer garment and we hear it talking about those type of garments with a priest. Is he now thinking that he's a priest? Which it couldn't be, he's not Levitic, he's not um, from the tribe of Levi, so he has no right to even take on any kind of action of that. Why make this garment? And then Gideon with this takes on a different lifestyle. That he refused to be king, but he lived like a king. If somebody throws down $1.6 million at your feet and you got all this other stuff, yeah, you can live like a king. He takes on this lifestyle. And it's not of a judge or a retired army officer. No, he takes on this as a wealthy person. He has all these wives. And he has this, and he has 70 sons from all his wives. Now, think about it. One man, 70 sons. They're all his. He has all these wives, and we know the one conqueror. He has 70, he is just living like this monarch, you know, has everything given to him. He's not being, you know, humble. He's not, you know, he's just got this whole other lifestyle. And like I say, now, you know, if he had taken his money and kind of lived a good life and went back home and did things, that would have been fine. But he takes on this elaborate lifestyle of the rich and wealthy, you know, we, you, the wealthy and famous, you know, we used to have shows like that. And it's contrary to what you expected from Gideon. He was walking with God. He tested God. God proved himself. Then Gideon had the confidence because God said the battle was hand, handed into his hands and Gideon comes back and he says, man, we're going at it. Let's go fight him. Yeah, he was confident in all this guy. And then all of a sudden he just turns back and everything becomes selfish. Give me all this gold. I guarantee you, Gideon probably in his head, if you think about it, if 135,000 men are killed in each word in a set of earrings, 135,000 sets of earrings of gold would be worth something. They didn't mind giving it up, but Gideon had it figured out. 135,000 sets of ear, golden earrings are worth a lot of money. It's a selfish act. Why ask for it? He had his share. He could go back home, not have to worry about being raided. But no, he asked for more. And it becomes a downfall. Because what happens in all, we hear the terms and all in verse 27, and all it says they played the harlot, the people did. He made the ephod and put it in the city, even over, and all the Israel went there whoring after it. What's that mean? They put it first. They wanted it. And what it is, when they talk about whoring, remember God uses that term when people worship other gods. And it's a terminology. They began to worship the ephod as some kind of symbol or some kind of gold compared to the golden calf or whatever. But that's what it's talking about. And it says, what it became a snare unto Gideon unto his house. 
It was a downfall. It was not something that was good. It was something that was bad. It affected Gideon and his house, but it also affected the people. Because from going from worshiping this ephod or holding it as this precious thing to worshiping Baal and other idols is not a big leap. And we see people do these type of things. They put people on pedestals. And it don't take long to transfer from worshiping God. And then you put somebody on a pedestal and for long you're worshiping that person and not worshiping God. You become. We see it in some churches. We see it in Sunday school. And you say, we'll see it in Sunday school. Yes. And it's, a famous, I mean, it's a well-known fact that the Sunday school teacher says, I'm not going to be here next Sunday. Near will have the class in a lot of places. Well, I'm not coming if they're not coming. I want to hear that substitute teacher. And, you know, I had a minister once tell me, he said he'd never tell his congregation where he wasn't going to be there the next week because he said half of them wouldn't come. And being in pulpit supply, I joked around a lot. I said, oh, by the way, the pastor left the seating arrangement with me, so I know who, which ones are here, here and which ones aren't. I mean, I mean, you just joke around with them. And a lot of them knew it because they'd look around. There's some people missing. They knew it. It don't take long to lose sight of God. It's easier to see the material than the spiritual. You're going to see the spiritual with your heart. You're going to see the material with your eyes. So how good are the eyes of your heart where you can see the spiritual? But that's what happens. The people, this ephod of gold that's worth, you know, all this. It's a downfall. And it's bad. Then it becomes a snare. And how do we know it happens? Because you go back to verses 33 through 35. And as soon as Gideon was dead, the children of Israel turned again and went a whoring after Balaam. As soon as Gideon died, they went right back to Baal. There was no trust in God. And it also says what in verse 35? This tells you that Gideon was not good and had done some things that turned. Neither showed they kindness to the house of Jerbaal, namely Gideon, according to all the good that she. Gideon had done some good things and probably had continued with his wealth to do some good things. But they didn't look favorably upon him anymore. They didn't look kindness. While he was alive, that was one thing. Why, you know, maybe that was a case of, you know, hey, Gideon shares his money. Maybe he was sharing his money some and helping some people out. But, you know, as soon as he's, he's dead and that money ain't coming out, it's, you know, fair weather friends. There's a lot of that that goes on in the world, too. Gideon had the chance to lead the people back to God. When he made the statement, and said, I will not be a king, but God will rule over you. Right then and there, he could have pushed it on through and said, we're going to get rid of all the idols in the land. We're going to turn back to God. We're going to follow the Levitical law. He could have pushed it on, and the people would have followed him to the nth degree, and there could have been a chance for Israel to turn back to God. But instead, he said, nope, you're to follow God. And then he says, oh, get, start giving me gold. He took him down the wrong path. Or he didn't stop him from going down the wrong path if you won't put him on the innocent side. He stepped back and let them do as they pleased. Now as long as Gideon lived for those 40 more years, they had peace. So just the reputation of Gideon was enough to keep everybody away maybe. Maybe that's why nobody came. But the opportunity was there. It was missed. And so far was it missed that as soon as Gideon was dead, they jumped right back to Baal. How many opportunities is God putting in front of you? I'm not talking about changing a nation. I'm talking about affecting somebody's life. We don't have to worry about, you know, we concerned saying, oh, we need to save this nation. God's called me to, 
you know, be the evangelist. I don't look at things that way. You know, a person once told me, and I've heard it other places, and and all, and it comes to memory every time I hear it. It's like, I want to grow where I'm planted. You're to grow where you're planted. And the medium is you're to do what you're supposed to do where you're at. Don't go looking for other pastures to go and say, oh, it's better over there or over here. No, you grow where you're planted. And you do what you're supposed to do. You're to serve the Lord the best you can where you're at. Gideon didn't do it. But you can. There's people you encounter every day that need an influence from God. They need that word from God. They need that prayer. They need that encouragement. They need that ministry. Remember, we as Christians should never tire of doing good. They need that goodness done to them. They need that love shown to them. Not manly love, but godly love. Gideon had that choice and he threw it away. Instead, everything you see from that point on, basically, is about Gideon. And it did not go well for Gideon. Now, obviously, you know, he died, his sons were well provided for. But you know what really is interesting? 69 of his 70 sons were killed by their half brother. Inside Gideon's own family, 69 of his 70 sons were killed by their half brother who later was killed by a woman who dropped a stone on his head. What does that tell you about what was going on at Gideon's house after this? That much hate, that much. Probably Gideon's fame, his celebrity that was just thrust upon him so quickly he just went to his head. He probably got so full of pride. Look what I did. Remember before the battle, Gideon was this humble. He depended on the Lord. He was, you know, he was hiding from the Midianites trying to get his grain ground. And, you know, he, he was being, he was having a humble spirit about him. He was just trying to make things work. But then all of a sudden the battle happens and he's in that mopping up operation. And all of a sudden he becomes vindictive. He becomes authoritative. You know, he executes judgment on Sakath and Peniel, and true, they needed it. He gave mercy to the you know the tribe of Ephraim because you know, hey, yeah, everything's good there. And then he comes back and he executes the judgment on the two kings, and everything is all around Gideon. And when they try to make him king, he says, no, the Lord will rule over you. And some people say he's even being pious in that statement. And many accuse Gideon of having a hidden agenda. Obviously something happened with Gideon. He was riding high. And if pride corrupted him, then it's what brought him to his knees and destroyed his family. It corrupted. See, we need to practice what Gideon should have. And Matthew 6, 30 says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things were added unto you. Gideon got it backwards. He wanted everything added unto him first. He saw that wealth and he said, give me that wealth. Give me the earrings and I'll take the wealth. And he never did seek the kingdom of God. Not truly. There's nothing from this point on that really says that Gideon did. It says he did some good things for the people, but even that, we're not sure what all was meant by that. But for his family to be destroyed and he created the ephod, which was a downfall for Israel, you can't think that everything was really good for Gideon as far as the life he was living. Gideon missed his opportunity for what he saw before him. 
what opportunities are you missing because you're looking with your eyes and not your heart? What is it that God's calling you to do? What opportunities are you putting before you every day? There could be a multitude of them. He could be putting a lot of things out there for you every day to bring glory to his name. But if you're not looking any further than what you see with your eyes, you'll miss it. Sometimes you got to look with your heart. More and more as Christians, we need to look with the heart. We need to be seeking the kingdom of God, looking to the spiritual things so that we'll understand God's will. So I pray that you won't slide like get in and get caught up with the world when really we need to fall in love with the heavenly. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. And Father, we praise you and give you the glory. And Father, let us be humble. Let us not be filled up with pride. Let us have a servant's heart. Let us be compassionate and caring. Father, let us seek thy will. And Father, let us not be afraid to do the things you've called us to do. Father, yes, we may have stepped out of our comfort zone, but do not let us be afraid. Give us the courage and the strength. And Father, give us the assurance that we know that you're always right there. Sometimes we can't know that you're there because we mentally block you out. But Father, burn through those images that we create in our mind. Father, let us walk in assurance that you're there. Guide us and direct us in all things. Bless us and keep together. And Father, we just pray for healing of those in need of healing and strength for those who are weak and wisdom for those who are asking questions. Father, we just pray all these things. Guide us and direct us. And Father, make us encouragers. Make us bold. And Father, keep us safe to we're joined together the next time. For it's in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Be safe and take care of each other and watch over each other. Encourage one another and seek God's will. Don't miss your opportunity when God puts it before you. Good evening. Have a good rest of the week.